This video looks at the symmetry properties of the Riemann curvature tensor and some of its consequences for a torsionless manifold at an arbitrary point P. It also shows how the Bianchi identity emerges from these properties of this tensor. So let's consider a manifold that is pseudo-Riemannian, i.e. ds squared is greater than zero, ds squared equals zero, or ds squared is less than zero. That's the line element squared. It's torsionless, and that in the affine connection, the lower two indices are symmetric, um, in that these two are equal under a, a swapping of the lower indices, beta and alpha, alpha and beta. So we have a torsionless manifold, which means it is symmetric in the lower two indices. Now the Riemann curvature tensor is given by this object here. It has one upper index which can be lowered to give, using the metric we can lower this upper index by summing it out, one down, one up, and that leaves us with R, alpha, mu, beta, gamma. So this is the Riemann tensor with one index lowered, all four indices lowered. Alright, now with a little bit of algebra we can write this as replacing the Riemann tensor here, in this part here, times this metric term here, then we can multiply through by the metric, and this is called, we can take the metric inside the partial derivative here, and this is called metric compatibility, and we take it inside, and we lower that index, so that brings the delta, the deltas cancel out, when they put alpha, same over here, and then with these uh, terms multiplied by each other, these affine connection terms here, or just connections multiplied together, we'll multiply all that by the um, uh, metric here. Now, <clears throat> we can express this more compactly as D, gamma, and then the affine connection with all three indices lowered. And we have this object here. Okay, now remember that the Christoffel symbol of the first kind a, B, C, all the indices lowered, is equal to this object here, and again more compactly can be written as this object here. So this metric term G, A, C, the partial derivative with respect to the coordinate X, B, can be written more succinctly like this. Alright, now when we do that, we get R alpha mu beta gamma, is D, D gamma of this object here, substituting in now, minus this object here, plus this part here, and carry out the operator through. Gives us this next term here. All right, and <clears throat> we can now collect terms because some of these will cancel out. Uh, the new alpha here, new alpha, um, this is plus a half here, minus a half, this one, they cancel out, and we're going to go from the six terms down to the four terms, <coughs> and here they are here, plus the bits on the end. It is one of the properties of a pseudo Riemannian manifold that at any arbitrary point P, it is possible to find local Cartesian coordinates x mu such that the metric evaluated at that point P, the metric is a function of the coordinates of the manifold, is equal to the flat space Minkowski metric, eta, nu, lambda. Now, <clears throat> the derivative, of course, of this, this is the, all the uh, elements in this metric are all constants, minus one and ones, and so the partial derivative of this with respect to any of the position coordinates on the manifold will be zero. So at the point P, and this point is entirely arbitrary, it could be anywhere on the manifold at any particular point, but once we've nominated a point and we've evaluated this at a point, the partial derivative of the metric disappears. Now as a consequence, that means that the affine connection evaluated at P will be zero but its derivatives will generally not be zero. 
So about this arbitrary point P, the curvature tensor can be written as this object here with those four terms we saw earlier, and the end bit, the metric times these um, affine connection terms multiplied together has all cancelled out. It's all got because of this, that last bit there from the previous slide has gone to zero. Now let's see what happens when we swap indices around. So we're going to start with our uh, alpha, mu, beta, gamma is this object here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to swap the first two indices. We'll leave the last two indices, beta and gamma, unchanged. So we're going to swap the first two indices, alpha, mu, up here, and that produces this object here when we swap them. Uh, so alpha is replaced by mu. So alpha up here becomes mu. Uh, mu up here becomes alpha. So mu here becomes alpha. And when we do that all the way through, <coughs> all the way through this, we get this object here, which is just the negative of this object here. If you have a look here, um, d gamma, d mu, g alpha, beta. Uh, d gamma, d mu, g alpha, beta. This is the negative of this. And so swapping the first two indices gives us the negative of the original object. Next thing, let's swap the last two indices. So starting with our original object here, we're going to swap beta and gamma. Here we are, gamma and beta there. So where beta is, we're going to put gamma. So beta here becomes gamma. And where gamma here is, that will become beta. So gamma here will become beta. And when we do that, again, we find that the object produced is the negative of what we started with. So this is the negative of the original expression. Keep going. This time around now, we're going to take the last two indices, indices, beta and gamma, and put them first. And the first two indices, alpha and mu, put those last. So here's our original object. And let's start swapping. So alpha will become beta. So alpha becomes beta. Mu becomes gamma. Mu becomes gamma. Beta becomes alpha. Beta becomes alpha. Gamma becomes mu, so gamma becomes mu. When we do all that the way through, and we'll just tidy it up in the next line, and what we find is that this object produced is identical to the original one. So we have our final product. So swapping the first two indices with the last two indices doesn't change anything. It gives us the same object. So we're looking at the symmetry properties of the Riemann tensor. Now to summarize, we have the following symmetry properties of the Riemann curvature tensor. This object here, if we swap the first two indices, we get the negative of the original object. Um, this one here, if we swap the last two indices, we get the negative of the original object. And if we swap the first two indices with the last two indices, we get the same object again. This is equal to this. <coughs> All right, so let's start with the original object again. Here we are. Here's our Riemann tensor with all four indices lowered. And let's start swapping some indices around now. Um, uh, beta and mu. Okay. Gamma, we're going to shove mu to the end. So this is a permutation of the indices. Move them about. And we'll produce this object here. And then again, alpha, bring the gamma over here and the mu beta there. Another permutation, produce this object here. Now when we add these uh, expressions together, we'll, these three will sum to zero. And uh, if you have a look here, gamma, mu, alpha, beta, and that will cancel out with this one here, mu, gamma, alpha, beta. Remember, partial derivatives commute. And we are talking about partial derivatives here. So that commutes. And with the metric 2, even if alpha and beta were swapped, uh, the fact that we have a torsionless manifold, that is a manifold with no torsion, would mean that g beta alpha would be equal to g alpha beta. The end result is when we go through here and add these terms together, they cancel to zero, giving us this relationship here. So this permutation of the indices 
gives us taking mu to the end there, the end, and here taking gamma to second place, leaving alpha fixed, and we'll get zero there when we sum them. Now this can be written more compactly as this object here with the square brackets, meaning to, per to permute, to rearrange the indices. Adding them all together gives us zero. <laughs> all right, let's return again to our arbitrary point P and both differentiate the Riemann curvature tensor and evaluate the result at this point. So the covariant derivative at this point P, the affine connection terms that are standing alone, that are multiplied together that we saw earlier, disappear, they go to zero, and we're just left with the partial derivatives of the affine connection. And if we take the partial derivative then, because we're at a fixed point P, and locally to that point P, the manifold will appear flat. It will appear flat in a Euclidean sense. So just infinitesimally close to the point P, this partial derivative here is equal to this object here. The terms, the two terms at the end where the affine connections are multiplied together will disappear. <coughs> now we permute some of the indices and add the result. So let's start again. And here's our original object. Here it is. At the point, evaluated at the point P. That's what the line there means. Evaluated at the point P. At, and that point P can be arbitrary. Uh, let's start permuting indices now. Um, so we start with alpha, mu, beta, gamma, and then we go to alpha, mu, gamma, mu, and the beta over here. See how it's moved about from there to there. Again, evaluated the point P as this object. And one more time, let's uh, rearrange things. When we do that, this now gives us a result that if we sum these three together, we will go to zero. You can see if you sum these together, you're going to go to zero. So nu, beta, alpha, mu, gamma, um, beta, nu, alpha, mu, gamma, and like I said, partial derivatives commute, so d beta, d nu, d nu, d beta, same thing, and so that term will cancel out with that term, and so on, and they disappear. And so we're left with this result here, with the covariant derivative, of the Riemann tensor, permuting the indices, not alpha, but permuting the other indices. When summed, all this will give us zero. Now, this result is known as a Bianchi identity. So here we are, we have the Bianchi identity. It can also be written in a more compact form. Um, we'll give the above result when combined with the symmetry relations derived earlier. So if we permute the square brackets around here, if we permute these three indices, here we get this object equal to zero. Okay. And that's it.